Hey, good morning. It's Nancy, the nurse practitioner here, and uh, happened to be away from my desk at home, but I've been thinking about all of you, and I want to do a video for you about osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. So we're going to be using my uh, screen here and share it with you, and we're going to go through some PowerPoint. But first, since we're getting close to Halloween, and I just love Halloween, I happen to have one of these wonderful little bony things. And it reminds me of my arthritis that I, have. <laughs> you know, I started getting this painful area in my finger from probably hunting and pecking on my uh, phone all the time. And now I'm getting this herbidens node, which ouch hurts. So arthritis is no joke. And uh, it does cause a, a big burden on our society because it reduces people's abilities to do things. So uh, let's get right into the, the PowerPoint and I'm gonna share my screen with you. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna talk about arthritis, how to improve your quality of life. And we're gonna learn about the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. And they're both very different and uh, have very different symptoms. So what we will learn today is the difference between OA, which is osteoarthritis and RA, which is rheumatoid arthritis. We will learn about pain management and other modalities, how diet can improve your quality of life with OA and RA, all about our kids and sports, big thing. Uh, and we need to really, really look at this for overuse injury for young kids and resources to help you out there. So like I said, ouch on that finger. And I could only imagine what it's like for like a 80 year old woman or, or, or even younger that has osteoarthritis of the knees or the hips or a couple fingers. It really hurts when the joint is swollen and uh, it's painful and it's piercing pain, makes your fingers stiff and crack and they don't work so well. Well, osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease in which a particular joint is ground down by injury or overuse. So I'll be showing you some pictures about that shortly. And there is some new data out there that came out September, October, 2019 in the issue of Clinical Experimental Rheumatology. It actually reported that with the general consensus, it's always been that rheumatoid arthritis is more debilitating. But this study actually showed and reported that over the last 40 years, uh, pain and functional disability in osteoarthritis has appeared to be severe and also similar to rheumatoid arthritis. And one more quick fact is that people with rheumatoid arthritis can also get osteoarthritis, but not the other way around. So go figure, it's just not fair. So let's talk about osteoarthritis first. It's the wear and tear of joints was considered the theory, but now it's not just the wear and tear, it's it's been replaced with a theory about the disease of the entire joint involving the cartilage, the joint lining, which is called the synovium, uh, and the ligaments and the bones. So they all get worn down and worn out so that there's no cushioning and there's bone on bone. And osteoarthritis is more common in women, middle-aged 50s to elderly people. It can um, be worse after strenuous activity like going on a hike or sitting in a car for a long time. And stiffness in arthritis, osteoarthritis, loosens up after about 30 minutes and can occur after sitting or moving or not moving for a long time. So let's take a good look at this knee. Here is a nice healthy knee to the left. This is our femur here and here's our tibia. And this is what makes up our knee, uh, kind of like cushion. And the meniscus is a little sandwich in between the bones. So when this is what you wanna see and this is what's a normal knee. Now, when a person has a diseased knee, these are little osteophytes, little calcifications that build up and grind. You can see the cartilage is now wearing down, bone spurs everywhere. And then there's this space that disappeared and now you're bone on bone. And you could see how that could be a problem. Now, I do want to say that's really important to know. And since we're stopping at the knee, we're going to talk about weight loss and how that does affect bone on bone problems. But it came out in the April 2021 issue of osteoarthritis and cartilage. And I also saw it on like WebMD and Mayo Clinic that for every one pound of weight you lose is a four pound reduction in the knee joint load. 
So can you imagine if you lost 10 pounds or 20 pounds, you're just going to have so many pounds of load taken off those knees. And you know, you actually may re reduce your chances of having to have a knee replacement. How about that? So it's really something about losing weight for all sorts of reasons. There's also arthritis that happens after surgery. You know, if you've had a um, bone break and then you've been casted, you've had an ankle that's been pinned, um, total hip replacement even, any post-traumatic also, uh, a fractured pelvis, uh, fractured elbow, after this injury, you actually can have damage to the joint surface. And later in years, you get arthritis. And I've noticed that with my patients. I've had people who said, well, I'm 80 now, but when I was 25, I was in a motorcycle accident and I fractured my pelvis. And now I have terrible pain in my lower back and my, my hips. And it probably is related to that injury. Meniscal tears and ligament injuries can cause instability as well, and additional wear and knee joint, which over time can result in arthritis. So that means if you're a basketball player, like my husband was, and you have a, a tear, uh, you have it repaired by arth arthroscopy, you know, later on in years, you may actually have arthritis just because of the manipulation to your knee. So let's go on to rheumatoid arthritis for a minute, some facts. Totally different arthritis. And by the way, there are other arthritis out there. There's, there's gouty arthritis, there's psoriatic arthritis. And um, when you feel like you have joint pain, it's good to see your general clinician, uh, nurse practitioner, PA, whoever, for a good workup. And we'll talk more about that to determine what is going on in those joints and what's the real problem. But rheumatoid arthritis is, is pretty um, important one. It's an autoimmune disease. And for those of you who know what that is, um, it involves overactive immune system attacks on healthy cells. And people with diabetes, um, people who have type one, people who have um, uh, thyroid disease, lupus, those are just a few of the auto, uh, autoimmune problems that are out there that do attack healthy cells. And the thing with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or RA is the inflammation is, is more systemic. You can have problems in your eyes. You can have problems uh, in other parts of your body. And you wake up in the morning and you don't feel good. You're tired. You have a low-grade fever. And your symptoms can come and go. You could say, I'm having a good day today. I could do stuff. Or today's not a good day. And the difference between OA and RA is RA is symmetrical. If you get it in one hand, you're going to get it in the other hand at the same time or the feet. And that's where it usually starts first, the smaller joints. And first notice is tenderness and pain. And if the symptoms last more than six weeks, you really should look and find out what's wrong. Um, stiffness can take up to 60 minutes or more to go away. It's worse in the morning. So the stiffness lasts longer. The pain could be all day. It could be a really bad day and you could have low grade fever. Little different than osteoarthritis, wouldn't you say? Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid and compare them. Well, on the left, as you see, here's osteoarthritis. You had this thinned cartilage. We talked about that space missing, and now the bones are rubbing together. And this is the synovial fluid or, or the, the synovial membrane around it. And it doesn't swell and get red and hot um, like it does when you look at rheumatoid. And look at how intense this is. Rheumatoid arthritis doesn't have a space problem, but because the synovial membrane gets inflamed and hot, the bone also has erosion. These are permanent damage to the bone and cannot be reversed a lot of times without serious medication and other remedies. So it's really important um, as we go on to say, you got to find out what the problem is because with rheumatoid arthritis, the earlier you find out that you have this inflammatory process, to nip it in the bud is really important because once the damage is done, like I said, you can't go back. So here again is looking at two skeletons. Again, osteoarthritis on the left, rheumatoid arthritis on the right. And look at the little blue dots. This is all the places that degenerative disease of arthritis um, occurs. As I mentioned, I have the Herberdin node here. And these are called Bouchard nodes when the middle of the knuckle the, this is the dip or distal interphalangeal joint, and this is the pip, the proximal. 
um, those are called um, Bouchard nodes. So you could have a Bouchard node on one finger and a Herberton node on another. And you've seen people's hands that get real nodular. That's where you start to see the lumps and bumps. But look at the difference. It's not symmetrical. Um, it involves mostly the fingers, maybe a toe, maybe a knee, and could be in the neck. But look what happens with rheumatoid. If you're gonna get in one shoulder, you're gonna get in the other, and that's an inflamed area. You can get it in both, both uh, wrists, uh, both feet, both ankles. The morning stiffness lasts longer, and there's extra articular involvement as well. And the fact that it's symmetrical is, is just so hard to, walk, you know, to have and deal with. Understanding what is the cause of joint pain is really important, and why is it so important? Well, we've kind of talked about that. Getting rid of pain is sometimes all that matters, but looking into the future, and the future is big. I mean, we're living longer, and, and rheumatoid arthritis, I mean, I had a friend who at 30 had rheumatoid arthritis, and her hands became so crippled that she became disabled, she couldn't even comb her hair. Um, that was over 50 years ago, and we didn't know a lot about rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, then actually my mother died of Sjogren's syndrome, which is a form of rheumatoid arthritis when she was only 68 and I'm 64 and I'm like, oh my gosh, am I going to get this? And we're going to talk about genetics in a little bit. Um, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we didn't know much about Sjogren's syndrome back in 1987 and she died from complications relating to that. And, and in this day and age, she would not have died. Uh, it's, it's just a shame when you think about what time will we'll do with, with research. But you know, the thing that you need to know, and according to the New York University Lenko Medical Center in New York City, um, Dr. Dr. Paula Rakoff, she's a rheumatologist and a clinical associate professor. She talks about, you don't wanna miss the opportunity for reversing the inflammatory component of rheumatoid arthritis. And you don't wanna wait to treat OA with potentially toxic medications if you don't need it but every RA patient eventually does get OA as well. So that your pain needs to be diagnosed correctly and reassessed every time. Such a, a good pearl for people to know. You know, I have a friend right now who's going through a lot of pain and she says it hurts in the morning and I'm going through with her. Maybe it's Lyme disease, maybe it's, but boy, it sure sounds like rheumatoid arthritis and she's adamant about not finding out what it is. And kind of scares me because I'm worried about her becoming um, disabled as time goes on. So what do we do to find out if we have rheumatoid arthritis or OA? Well, usually first, first things that do help for OA is an x-ray. And you know, x-rays we know look at bone, they look at dense structures, and they help distinguish among various forms of arthritis. They, you know, x-ray of an knee may show a narrowing of the joint space, changes in your bone and formation of bone spurs or the osteophytes I showed you in the other picture. And some other tests, occasionally a magnetic resonance imaging or MRI is used or CT because sometimes they need to determine more deeply on the soft tissue and look at uh, what's going on with the cartilage and things um, beyond bone. And blood work, blood work is really, really important. It doesn't really help you with OA, but it does help you eliminate what the diagnosis is. So, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is, is not easily diagnosed by rheumatoid factor, but there are some things that can be done. And in the ESR, which is uh, erythrocyte uh, sedimentation rate, is a blood test that just looks at inflammation in the body. Unfortunately, it's very um, sporadic and um, you don't know if there's inflammation somewhere else or infection. Uh, a rheumatoid factor or RF are proteins and these are uh, that an immune system produces when it attacks healthy tissue, but they found that it's not conclusive. Some people have a positive rheumatoid factor, but they don't have symptoms. Sometimes they have a negative rheumatoid factor and they have symptoms. So go figure. So when you go to your clinician to find out what's up, um, you need to have a full blood count first and to determine you know, what's going on in the health of your body. Usually anemia is common in a person with rheumatoid arthritis. So you may see that you're anemic as well, which may be the reason for your fatigue. C-reactive protein, another protein test that's made by the liver um, shows general inflammation is somewhere in the body. And an anti-CCP, which is an anti-cyclic I know I'm going to screw this up. Citrullinated peptide 
are autoantibodies that are found in the blood of people with RA. Again, you know, you could do all these, you know, big tests and they may not be totally conclusive. The thing that is important is once you know you have RA and you do repeated tests every now and then to see how you're doing when you're on any medication, they will determine whether your inflammation is getting worse or better. And also your symptoms will tell us that. So how do you treat osteoarthritis? Well, there's lots of treatments out there. And um, one thing that I want to tell you is that, you know, I used to tell my patients, you know, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you are um, considering Tylenol. Tylenol is the number one treatment. So um, I usually tell them that's the gold standard treatment, but you know, Tylenol doesn't come without its problems. It does go through the liver and, um, you know, but it is okay to take it for, for most of us, um, also combined with other things. So NSAIDs, ibuprofen or naproxen, just be careful because there is some GI effects of that, stomach problems and, and bleeding. And if you're on some medications like um, blood thinners, like uh, Blavix, you can't really take those. Then there's the COX-2 with like Mobic or Celebrex. They're less um, troublesome for the GI tract but you need to make sure that you talk to your uh, doctor about or clinician what is best for you. And of course, there's other things you can do. You know, we, you know there's local steroid injections you can get in your knee. Um, you can get surgery on your knee, which there's so many surgeries out there. And we'll just quickly go over that slide. And then there's collagen injections to help rebuild uh, cartilage, which is really cool. Um, the American College of Rheumatology guidelines suggest that exercise should be one of the mainstays of treating osteoarthritis at the hip and knee. So you got to keep it moving. You really, really do. Back to some of the medications again, like we talked about the COX-2. Uh, one thing I do need to remember to tell you, and I missed this, was if you had a heart attack or stroke or angina or blood clots, hypertension, or you're sensitive to aspirin products or sulfa, or other NSAIDs, you should not be on any COX-2s. So you gotta make sure that you are talking to your clinician about all the things you've had. If you're especially going to a rheumatologist, don't forget your, your grocery list of problems and all your medications. Thermocare pads are really cool. They come in a box with adhesive. You can put them on your back and they stay on your back under your clothes and you can wear them for 12 hours and they're moist heat, they're really, really nice. And I bought something that's called hot cold or something like that. And it's a gel pack that you could either make cold or you could boil it and make it hot and use over and over again. It has crystals in it. That was really cool because it's reusable because some of these things cost a lot of money if you have to buy them every day. Okay, so that's pretty much all about that. Let's go to the next slide. Some more non-surgical treatments Well, we talked quickly about loss, losing weight and how important that is. Um, and your daily life can protect your knees, you know, by minimizing activities that aggravate it. Like let's say you have to climb stairs and you have 20 stairs in your, your townhouse to each level. You may want to consider getting into a ranch or moving into a space that's all on one floor just to, you know, help your knees make it through. You know, you may want to switch your activities from jogging or tennis to something lower like swimming or cycling, where you're putting less stress on your knee or on your hips. Okay, so you could change your activity so that you prevent more wear and tear. There's physical therapy. I mean, if you really have pain and you need to help with increasing range of motion and flexibility, a physical therapist can help you find ways to strengthen the muscles around the bones so that you have better stability. Um, to an individualized exercise program could be, be made for you. Talk with your clinician about referring you to a physical therapist. And once you learn the program, it's yours to have and you could take it home and do it every day. Assistive devices, you may need a cane. You know, it took a long time for my mother-in-law to agree to a cane and she had osteoporosis and uh, she had numbness in the bottom of her feet from neuropathy. And there were so many chances of her falling. And we did hear that she had been falling. Well, she finally gave into it and she had a cane everywhere. <laughs> she came in every room and every car, but you know, hey, at least she got used to using the cane. And you know, canes are cool. You could paint them, you could put designs on them. They can match your clothes. Maybe you could even make cane sleeves. They would be really funky and you can have fun with it as part of your daily wear, you know? 
Also make sure that you're wearing good shoes and you could put inserts in your shoes. You know, I got these inserts that I move from shoes to shoes. And I'll tell you what, my lower back feels so much better than it ever did because I tend to walk with my belly forward and the insert actually changed the way I position myself to walk. And maybe over time, I'll find out that I, I would have gotten really severe arthritis in my lower back or like spinal stenosis, but I just put inserts in my shoes, you know, long ago to help prevent this. If your knee bothers you, you may need to buy one of those little sleeves. You can buy them in the grocery store. They have a hole over the patella and you just slip them on. There's these new copper devices that are supposed to help wrists and, and, and uh, joints. So ch check that out too. And um, there are two types of braces. They're often used for knee arthritis. There's the unloader, which is a brace that shifts weight away from the affected portion of the knee. And while there's a support brace, which helps support the entire knee. So if you go see a physical therapist or an orthopedist, you'll learn about some of these devices to really help you prevent having surgery down the, down the road. We talked about applying heat or ice, using pain relieving. Oh, capsaicin is really cool. Asper cream you can use. Just be careful because wash your hands after using them because these things, um, you know, are, are tough on the eyes. <laughs> you don't want to get it in your eyes. Um, you can wear elastic bandages to provide support to the knee. You know, there's lots of things out there that can help you there. And then let's talk about alternative therapies. The first one is acupuncture. Well, it, it's, we know what it is, we've heard about it. It's where you use fine needles to stimulate specific body areas to relieve pain. And, and you need to find an acupuncturist that is certified and make sure you check how they sterilize their needles. Okay, really important. Then we're gonna talk about magnetic pulse treatment. It works by applying a pulsed signal to the knee. I guess it's kind of like a TENS unit or maybe it's not, but um, that's what I remember um, those kind of things working like. Platelet-rich plasma, this is pretty intense, where your platelets are separated from your blood and is re-injected into your knee. The platelets contain growth factors thought to help reduce the symptoms of inflammation. Pretty neat, but probably kind of expensive. But if it works for you, it's worth every dime. And then stem cells are basic cells that are found in your blood that have the potential to grow into new tissue when injected into a joint space. That's pretty neat because when you think about it, you know, stem cells are like, are cells that could grow into anything you need them to. So that's a very interesting concept. And we're not gonna go into surgery, but there's all sorts of otomies and ostomies and replacements and, uh, meniscal tear repairs and, and all sorts of stuff, pinning. Um, hopefully you don't get to that point. If you lose the weight and you take care of your pain um, and you get medical care to find out what it is early. So this is the part that I really love because I always land on going to diet. Um, we're gonna quick go through this slide, but then I'm gonna go over some food and we'll spend a few minutes on this because I say in most of my videos that food is where it's at, and um, it's really important if that you um, look at what you're eating and how you can reduce inflammation. And there are a lot of foods with inflammation out there. So let's look at them. Highly processed foods, stuff in a box, stay away from the box styles. I hate to say it, but I'm thinking of things like rice aroni and hamburger helper, whatever. Look at the box and see if they have trans fats in them. If it's coming from a box, it's probably got a lot of preservatives and ingredients in it that you do not need. And eating fresh is the best way to go. They put on the list French fries. Oh no, everybody loves French fries, <laughs> but they're fried and uh, they're not really good for us a lot and every day. Soybean and corn oil, do not cook with these. Corn syrup, it's in everything, ketchup, hot dogs. Um, just take a look at the ingredients. It'll blow your mind. So try to get things with low sugar. You could buy barbecue sauce now with that's sugar-free. You can buy ketchup that's sugar-free. Look at the labels. And sorbitol, it's also an inflammatory maker. So look at the labels for that as well. And how about this? Barbecuing and blackened foods that are grilled at high temperatures. When you make chicken and it's got the stripes of black on it and it looks real juicy and yummy, well, it's actually destroying these proteolytic enzymes that reduce inflammation. And those enzymes are what we need in our gut to prevent leaky gut. 
So as you eat more and more barbecue, and I'm saying you can have some, but just in moderation. Uh, hey, here's more bagels, yikes, pasta, white pasta, muffins, anything that has gluten in it leads to leaky gut and it causes problems with, with these uh, enzymes not working and, and increases inflammation because you know, our gut is our second brain and you have to have a healthy gut in order to have a healthy system. So what can you do to reduce the, this inflammation that could cause havoc on everything in our body, not just our joints? We always seem to be going back to the Mediterranean diet. So here I am with my husband, we're out you know, fishing last night. I caught a couple of fish and I'm, boy, oh boy, I have to do a lot of work, make some vegetables and have this nice Mediterranean diet. Things like brown rice and whole breads, organic eating, eat lean proteins like chicken and turkey and lean cuts of red meat spices and also limiting the amount of alcohol you drink to one drink for women and two for men because otherwise it increases your c-reactive protein I'm the spokesman for academy of nutrition and dietetics they talk about tea well green tea has polyphenols and it's really great with reducing and preserves the cartilage and bone it does have some caffeine so don't have it before bed you want to avoid sodas that are full of sugar or aspartame or phosphoric acid, because that phosphoric acid reduces calcium absorption. And also coffee is great. It fights free radicals and cell damage. So coffee, I love coffee. So, hey, I guess that's a good thing. And then dairy, milk. Studies are confusing. So we say it causes inflammation, but drinking milk may prevent gout and fight progression of osteoarthritis. You know, remember when your parents were younger, we had the milk box, we were eating, we were drinking whole milk and it was really good. And my parents were fat and they didn't have high cholesterol. So I don't know. Let's talk about juices, orange juice, tomato, pineapple, and carrot juice. They all have antioxidants in them and vitamin C, which reduces free radicals. Okay. Something to think about. And what about your Nutribullet? your smoothies, it's better because the whole fruits and vegetables are in there with the fiber and the antioxidants. You can add spinach, you can add kale uh, and berries. Just make sure you check that they're organic because those things need to be organic or they're considered dirty foods. And you can see that in some of my other videos. Also yogurt, probiotics are in yogurt. Make sure it has low sugar and they, and they also carry good bacteria. Kefir is a fermented beverage and, and you could add it to anything and it has increased pro probiotics in it. Okay, and red wine, when we talk about resveratrol, it decreases osteoarthritis in the knees and reduces rheumatoid arthritis. But you know, it's controversial in some studies, just uh, be careful with the wine. And water, hey, just keep the joints lubricated. You need to drink eight, eight ounces a day of water and liquids. It flush, flushes out many of the toxins in your body. And eat a lot of colorful foods, avocado, sharp cheddar, dark leafy bell peppers, olives, onions, carrots, mustard or oil vinegar with dried spices, lean fish. Um, you can have some sirloin, just make sure it's not pre-marinated when you buy it. Um, no processed ham or sausages, keep them at a min minimum because they increase that C-reactive protein marker. We talked about pasta and grains. You know, they're good to eat if they're, if it's furrow or millet, brown rice, whole wheat pasta, frozen fruits and vegetables without sugar are perfect. Bread high in fiber, 100% grain, avoid the white rice and the white bread and the, because they do not help fighting your um, inflammation. So you could go on the Arthritis Foundation and I'm gonna give you some of this on my Caregiver Success Facebook page where you can get an ebook and podcast and you can download the 36 tips for an arthritis friendly diet. Very, very cool. You may wanna check that out. Um, I'll give you some more resources in a few minutes. I just wanna keep going here. You know, I went on WebMD Care and they talked about getting spicy. You know, I love spices. I have a rack of spices all over the place. They add color like paprika, perks up your food. It has capsaicin in it, which we just talked about that you could put on your knees, but it's better in your food. Um, you can get it from chili peppers, the capsaicin, red peppers and cayenne pepper. Ginger and turmeric and garlic have similar reactions. So go for it, add them in. And just don't overlook sugar. 
check the yogurt, check your cereal, the fat-free salad dressing, the tomato sauce. Um, the American Heart Association says women should eat no more than 25 grams of added sugars a day and men limited to 37 grams. Wow, okay, so we've gotta be careful about that. And lentils, red, green, black, and brown are really good and high in fiber. And uh, they're good in soups and Indian foods. And olive oil, good fat. The extra virgin ver versions have a natural chemical called olanthol, which sharing similar properties with ibuprofen. How do you like that? We talked about avocados and nuts, and they're all good to eat in moderation. And, and white button mushrooms are really yummy and great. And we talked about lean steaks, porks, lamb. Um, too much fat in these in these meats can cause inflammation. Cold cuts, keep it to minimum, and hot dogs if you can help it. All right, and eating fatty fish, two servings a week of salmon, sardines, mackerel, and tuna. It's the omega-3 in it that tames inflammation. So one more thing that came out of the research I went through was the um, foods that were called the nightshade family, eggplant, tomatoes, potatoes. They're all members of that family. These veg veggies contain the chemical solanine, which some people claim aggravates arthritis and inflammation. So you may wanna see how you feel after eggplant, tomatoes and potatoes. And if those bother you, eliminate them from your diet, okay? So we spend a lot of time on food and food is where it's at, a lot of it. Arthritis is a pretty serious problem because it does cause inflammatory problems throughout the whole system. And, and that's pretty scary because it's not only your joints bothering you, but it could be your eyes. Um, it can affect um, other parts of your body. So, and your heart and your lungs, because, you know, collagen and is infecting every part of our bodies. And my mother did have that. She had dry eye syndrome. She had problems with her skin. Her, she had trouble with her gums. All her teeth fell out in her forties. It's just not funny. And a lot of it was due to um, this whole inflammatory process she had going on. DMARDS or DMARDS, I'll just call them, are the first line defense and it's used, it's called disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And so they're supposed to reduce the chronic inflammation. Some examples of them are Enbrel, Humira, which was also is used for Crohn's disease, Remicade, all biologics given by injection. And there's more, com more conventional ones, methotrexate, which we know has been used for cancer, sulfasalazine, hydrochloroquine. And um, these drugs are all from they found out by accident that malaria and lupus and other conditions of inflammation actually also help rheumatoid arthritis. You may have to have a combination of NSAIDs like a leave and Advil, and you may have to take prednisone. You know, the thing is, it's the goal of treating the, the RA. Uh, it's called uh, treat to target, T to T. -t, 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 -t. And uh, what that means is that, you know, everybody's different. No two people, even with the same diagnosis are alike. And it's like a puzzle trying to find the pieces to put together in order to make their, their um, quality of life better. So it's really important to find a good rheumatologist that you can work with that will help you. But the essential idea here, everybody, is to slow the joints from get, getting permanent damage. You know, we're talking about adults, we're talking about older people. But you know, I'm finding that my videos are getting more and more into talking about younger people, 20s, 30s, 40s. Why wait till I'm talking to you in your 80 and you have rheumatoid arthritis when you could be in your 20s and may have the same, um, you know, have problems that you could have uh, taken care of. You know, kids in sports, the parents want them to do good. The coaches, you know, you're a great hitter and, and you're a great soccer player. But look at this girl on the left. And this, these are flyers that have been put out. And I'm going to also include these for you on my Caregiver Success Facebook page, where you can see this girl. She's a great kicker. Well, look what's happening to her knee. And they're finding out that some kids train all year round for one sport, like soccer or football. And the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine want to help young athletes prevent overuse injuries. So you have to change positions. You have to be a goalie. Then you have to be out in the field, a runner. You, you've got to play first base. You may want to try, try football. And you know, they're finding out that if you don't use specialization in one sport and give those joints a rest for a year and try another sport, even if you were good at the other one, 
it's better for your body, especially growing bodies that are only like 10 or 11 years old, still growing their joints. So you as a parent or a coach are an integral part in preventing overuse injuries from one sport. And we just talk about, you know, specialized sports have been linked to reducing motor skill development. So don't stick to one sport just because your kid is good at it. You, the caregiver, which is the coach or the parent, can help assure bones and joints remain healthy. And this is with the following tips. Let's go on to that. Get a preseason wellness check for, to identify possible health concerns that may lead to overuse injuries. Properly warm up and cool down before and af after athletic activities prepare the body and help it recover. Regularly incorporate strengthening and stretching exercises into their training. Hydrate adequately to maintain health and minimize cramps. Play different positions or sports throughout the year to minimize overuse injury risk. We talked about that as well. Here's a few more. Don't play while injured or in pain. Really important. So you have to be honest with yourself. Even, if, even though you're a younger person and you want to not let the team down, but if you have an injury, you're just going to make it worse. Rest, take care of it, and it keeps the kid in the game for life. We talked about not playing the same sport year round. Encourage a young athlete to take regular breaks, including one season off each year. Overuse injuries happen, happen uh, gradually over time. So you could be a young athlete and may be injured, but you don't even know it. You don't seek any help at all. You get severe pain. And then you find out that uh, this injury has gotten worse over time. So you need to get proper treatment, okay? So this is really cool. I found this and I thought it'd be good for you to go on the Mayo Clinic Marketplace. You can actually download this book on managing your joint pain for an active life. There's so much good information out there. And again, I will share this with you on my caregiver Facebook page. So know me, hey, I'm Nancy, the nurse practitioner. I also have a book out called Caregiver, Caregiver Success. It's on my caregiversuccess.com page. It comes in an ebook. Your mother uh, could be in New York with an aide and you could have the book out there for her and you can live in Oklahoma and you could be reading about constipation or other medical problems that mom might have. So let me show you the book. This is my patient and her daughter and some of the many tips I show you in the book, how you can take care of yourself. You know, it's not just for you, it's for the caregiver. And we're all caregivers out there. We take care of somebody that may need help. And, you know, I'm finding out more and more that, like I said, my videos are about prevention. So let's talk about things we could do and for 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, so that we can all stay well and not land up having disease. So if you like this video, hit the bell, subscribe to my channel, Caregiver Success. I'll see you at the next video. Take care, everyone. Bye for now.